This is the Houdini Games Tool webinar. My name is Chris Hebert. I'm the Director of Marketing at SideFX. This webinar is about the Houdini Games Tools. It should be about uh, an hour long, plus Q&A at the end. We're going to do a whole Q&A session at the end. Um, feel free to use the chat. There's a chat uh, tool feature as part of uh, this uh, Zoom experience. Uh, if you've got a question, though, put it in the Q&A so that we can uh, organize those questions and make uh, sure they get answered at the end. Uh, or at least we'll try to. Um, so Houdini and side effects have been in the game space for uh, over 10 years, uh, believe it or not. Um, we've had more of a focus over the last five years. And uh, in about uh, three, almost three uh, years ago, uh, started doing a, a game tool development path where uh, we're helping game developers um, uh, with faster workflows based on the work that uh, the guys that you're going to hear from today are going to talk all about. Uh, and I would say, though, that the, even though the game's tools are designed with game development in mind, there are tons of uh, film, TV, and advertising people already using them uh, in that space as well, uh, speeding up the workflows. So feel free to use them. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, in the future as well, for sure. So side effects and Houdini uh, have been used on AAA games, including Ghost Recon, Mafia 3, Far Cry 5, Horizon Zero Dawn, Uncharted 4, and Steep. And mobile games such as Modern Combat Versus, Candy Crush, and indie games such as Planet Alpha, Ari and the Secret of Seasons, Suki and the Shadow Claw, and more. Go check out sideeffects.com and uh, look at the, the customer stories if you want to learn uh, how Houdini has been used in those games. About a year and a half ago, our games segment director, Judith Crow, made a really smart decision in bringing the guys that we're about to hear from uh, onto the team. And they've been working on uh, the game tools ever since. Luis Cruel is a senior technical artist here at Side Effects. He's got more of a, a decade of production experience in games, worked on several of the largest franchises in the industry, including Halo, Call of Duty, Doom, Madden, and Just Cause. Mike Linden is a senior technical artist at Side Effects. He has a broad range of experience creating computer graphics for commercials, films, video games. His fascination with the world around us and the desire to blend art with his technical tinkering has led to his work making uh, rolling, <laughs> rolling cloudscapes in Ender's Game, generating raging fires in Gears of War, and trapping penguins in an avalanche of snow for Happy Feet 2. And uh, Paul is a technical artist. At Side Effects, he studied international game architecture and design studies at Breda University of Applied Science, uh, Sciences. It used to be NHTV, now it's called Breda University of Applied Sciences. He enjoys writing tools to support effective art pipelines to help others create amazing things in a better, faster, and more flexible way. So uh, really looking forward to this webinar and uh, over to you guys, starting with Luis. Yeah, hey everybody. So I'm gonna take you guys through a quick overview of what the tools are. Um, just a quick slide deck and then we'll dive right into the tools. So we'll split up. Um, each of us are showing um, a few tools. I'm showing three, Mike's showing three, and then Paul is showing four. Um, that's going to give you the top 10 tools that we've worked on in the past year. So let's jump right ahead and let me share my screen. So let's just double check. Cool. Um, so I'll just dive right into the slide deck if everyone can see that. Okay, so what we're going to do today is um, basically talk about what is the, the game dev tool set, and then we're going to go into the tools demos, and then we're here for you guys for as long as you need um, for Q&A. So um, chat, uh, we'll be online for a little bit after. So the game development tool set, um, hopefully you guys are familiar with it, but for those that are not, um, it's a set of over 100 tools to basically help game developers leverage Houdini. Um, they range from everything from simple tools to make some... Um, Do I still have you guys? Someone confirm? My Zoom flickered. We're still here. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, basically a set of over 100 tools to help game developers leverage Houdini. Um, they range from things like uh, generating anime inclusion all the way for photogrammetry, um, effects, getting vertex animation textures. So we'll run through some of those today. Uh, the main reason why we wanted to do this is to soften the learning curve. Um, a lot of people coming from games getting into Houdini. A lot of the times Houdini is not their primary package. They don't have a lot of experience. They just want to hop in, do something, and then get data out. Um, and then we also want to improve the Houdini user experience a little bit, especially for the new users. So in film, 
there's a lot of experienced people that have been using Houdini since before it was called Houdini. Uh, but in the game segment, that's definitely um, a newer uh, area. Um, and uh, the team, like you saw today, it's myself, Mike, and Paul. So the tools, if you can think of Houdini as this kind of large sandbox filled with nodes and tools that you can use, uh, generally speaking, a lot of the studios will build their own in-house tools. And these can be custom exporters, they can be um, little utilities that you can kind of see that, oh, I made this pattern of a few nodes a lot, so let me turn that into an HDA and share that with my studio. So what we do as a games team is we visit everybody out in the world and then we see which of those tools really should just be part of Houdini. Um, like a good example is the calculate aim and occlusion node, like that should just be built in. Um, so we take some of those tools on and then ship those as part of the game development tool set. Um, I'm going to show a quick video on how to install it a little bit later, uh, but they are all hosted in GitHub, um, but you can also download them straight from inside of Houdini. So the idea here is that we're completely decoupled from Houdini. It's not like you need to get a new build. You can still stay on your version of Houdini and get new daily versions of the game tools, um, basically decoupled from Houdini. Um, there's over 100 of them now, which meant that we started doing a lot more testing and um, smoke tests and unit tests to make sure everything is kind of working. We actually used that heavily um, when we did the switch to 17. So when a couple of the things changed or warnings popped up, we were able to basically make sure all the tools were in a decent enough state to, to push them out to 17. Um, and then we did add some analytics. Uh, we have over a thousand users using these tools now and oh, close to 53 uh, countries and they're using it a lot. Um, the, the one thing in the analytics that was kind of cool is because we have so many nodes, we didn't really know which ones were being used. And we had some suspicion that some were just not used at all and just kind of rotted away um, because we've been doing this for close to three years now. Uh, and surprisingly, pretty like 99% of the tools are being used, which is pretty exciting. Um, so what, what are these nodes? Uh, we kind of break them down into a few categories. Um, there's common workflows that are just things that should just be built into Houdini. Some of it is maybe it's a little too complicated to do. So like baking in Houdini with the big texture node might be a little too technical. Um, so we simplify that. Um, we do a lot of work with third parties. So we're going to show a couple of them today. And then a lot of just basic IO, basically getting data in and out of Houdini. Um, so why do we build them? So if you think about Houdini, as a Formula One car to where you need to be kind of in good shape, you kind of need to know the underlying hood, everything under the hood and how the car operates, you need to know how to drive a manual car. Um, that's usually what's expected out of a Houdini artist. It's like, it's a little more technical, it's a little bit, you kind of need to understand the underlying math, maybe even need to code a little bit. Um, the higher level tools give you that same kind of feeling and experience of making use of Houdini and making awesome content with it, but maybe with a little less more technical. We kind of coated with a little bit of paint to make the experience a little bit better for you. And this is the last kind of touch slide because Paul said that um, we have too many slides. Um, so I wanted to make sure we keep through these quick so we can get to the tools. Uh, but the, these tools are for you guys and by you guys. So um, it all starts from us talking to you guys. You guys say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had this tool to make uh, rock generation better? Um, and then we start basically working with you, generate a minimal viable product, get feedback, make a release, get more feedback, fix bugs, and then kind of do that loop forever. Um, so it is definitely focused on you. It's not just us coming up with random tools that we want to build. Um, there's a little bit of that, but for the most part, it comes from um, you guys driving us um, and telling us what you need. Um, here's a quick video for those that are not familiar with how to download the tool. So all you have to do, you can do that right now. Um, just launch Houdini. Uh, load the game development tool set that will be, uh, it just ships with Houdini now. It's only going to have a single button, which will give you the ability to download the tools. Um, you can choose to use the production build or not. Um, and then you just hit update. And that's going to download all of the, the zip files from GitHub, patch the Houdini environment, um, and just work. So if you restart Houdini, you will have all of the tools kind of um, ready for you. And... That's it. So now let's go on to the demos. Um, Paul's going to go first, then myself, then Mike. So off to Paul. Uh, thank you, Luis. Um, let me just share my screen. All right. Do you see this? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. Um, the screen recording software you use um, might take a bit of uh, resources from my machine, so it might seem a bit slower. Uh, but if you use the tools themselves, they're really quick. Uh, so the first tool we're going to talk about is the uh, skinning converter. 
Uh, so the scanning converter is a uh, HDA, Houdini digital asset, that can convert any uh, non-changing topology deforming mesh sequences into a bone-based animation. So for game engines, uh, you can't really bring vertex animations into a game engine by default. There are, of course, solutions like, for example, vertex animation textures, but um, sometimes you want to have a bone-based animation. For example, if you want to um, put over a secondary uh, physics simulation in engine, or you want to have some interactivity with a, a player character, for example. Uh, the tool has a bunch of uh, parameters to play with, uh, which allow you to get a result that uh, you're looking for. So let's take a look at the tool. Um, so what we do is we just type a skinning converter after you've installed the game development tool set, and that gives you this node here. Uh, let me just close this video. Um, what you then see is the tool has three inputs. Uh, the left input is where you want to have your deforming mesh sequence. So we have this simple cloth which is falling, and we want to convert that into a bone-based animation. So we just select our cloth sim and plug it in on the left, and if we then visualize it, we can now see that we already have our grid here uh, with these orange spheres on it. So these orange spheres will basically become bones as soon as we convert it. The tool has a bunch of uh, parameters to play with. Um, at the top here, we can see we have a tab called Direct Conversion. This is what you use to convert your mesh with. So at the top, first thing you need to do is set your frame range. So in this case, since my simulation is exactly 50 frames, I will set it to 1 to 50. We also have a bunch of uh, capturing methods. Uh, we have biharmonic capture and we have proximity capture. I recommend using biharmonic capture uh, because it's, uh, it, it does a really good job at uh, capturing uh, the mesh but sometimes it's a bit slow. So if you want to have a quicker capture speed, I would use proximity, but you'll have some uh, less quality, basically. Um, so for the bone placement, it is, of course, important to know how many bones uh, you're putting down. And this is what you can do under the bone placement control tab. So with this tab, uh, you can either choose uniform placement, which allows you to uniformly uh, distribute bones on your mesh, right? So the more bones you have, the higher quality uh, conversion you'll get, so the more identical your bone-based animation will be compared to your uh, your vertex-based animation. Um, you can also choose adaptive placement. So with adaptive placement, what the tool essentially does is it looks through the entire frame range of your simulation and then figures out which regions need more bones than others. And it does that based on the analysis method. It does that based on area deformation based. So it looks at the deformation of a mesh on specific uh, regions of the mesh. It can do it based on curvature. So if uh, specific uh, places in your, on your mesh uh, bend a lot, you should use curvature based. And if you have a mesh that, um, that is somewhat stationary, but some parts move faster than others, you might want to use uh, velocity based. Uh, but for now, what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to use the uniform placement. With the seed parameter, we can get some different results uh, without changing the number of bones. And with the influence radius, we can basically control what the uh, influence radius of the capturing process is. Uh, this one is most important for the uh, proximity capture, since the biomonic capture might override this. So once we have something we like, um, all we need to do is simply hit Convert to Bones, and we can see that we now get this pop-up, which says Start a Conversion, Generating Skeleton, Baking Skeleton, and then it tells you the conversion is complete. It will also tell you where uh, the output result is. So in this case, it's at the object level in a subnet called Skinning Conversion, Geometry 1, uh, 84 bones. So you can see uh, what the result of you is. Once you go up to object level, uh, you might see that Houdini is processing something. It's now actually doing the capturing phase. So it didn't do that while uh, generating the bones. It's doing that right now. What we're seeing now is this is already the, uh, the, convert, uh, the converted result. So we see these small pins. These are the actual bones. So if we hit play now, this is actually the converted result. It's not the, the mesh we see here. If we enable the other one, we can compare the two to see if we're happy enough with uh, the result. Uh, if we want to have a better comparison, uh, what we need to do is we once again dive into our subnet, uh, into our geometry node where we have our uh, conversion, and then we can enable this error visualization tab. And with this error visualization tab, we can essentially see how uh, identical the conversion is with our mesh, right? Uh, so since it's pretty red, uh, we can either decide to completely change the number of bones um, or we can, for example, use the uh, adaptive placement, set it to, let's say, area deformation based, increase the number of bones, and then hit convert to bones again. Once we've done that, uh, we can go back to object level. It does the capturing process again. 
just wait for that to calculate. And then we can see that we now have an updated result, um, which is a lot more identical to uh, the source file, as you can see. So they're really overlapping right now. Uh, once we have that, uh, we can simply export it to a game engine. But to do that, uh, we're going to look at a more interesting uh, result. Uh, so we also have this other example. Uh, say we have this marker style, and uh, we did some Velm sims. One of the interns, Danica, did that. And uh, we want to bring that into a game engine. So if we enable that, I already did the conversion beforehand, and we hit play, we can see that this is the converted result of um, the simulation. But since we want to have this in a game engine, we need to export it. So what we do is we simply go to File, we click Export, and select Filmbox FBX. If we then press here uh, on uh, Select File, we can specify the, the location of where we want to export something. So let's call this um, uh, spooky, spooky Cloth. FBX, why not? And hit export. Then for the export path, we of course need to select uh, what we want to export. So let's select this market tarp uh, 108 bones. So we simply select a subnet, which on the inside has all our bones and the geometry and the null, which is the root in this case. So select that, hit accept pattern. Uh, we can leave these to default, and then we simply hit export. Houdini will then export it out to an FBX. You wait for that to finish. And then once it does that, uh, we can go into our game engine, uh, in this case, uh, Unity, uh, go into the folder where we want to import it, select our, um, our file, and we can then just drag and drop that into the uh, content browser. If we then bring that into the scene, uh, let's make this a bit bigger. Set this to 100 and hit apply, we should then have our cloth. Oh, there it is, that's huge. That's much better. All right, so we have this, uh, but it doesn't play our animation yet. Uh, since in Unity, we need to create something called an animation controller. So we just right click on our, um, on our asset browser here and do create and select animation controller. We can just call this whatever we want. So we'll just call this, um, Spooky controller. We then just open this and we drag our animation in here, uh, which in this case, for some reason, did not import. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, we still have our other examples uh, where we already have that set up. So in this case, we can see that we have our file, uh, in this case, for this market tarp, which has an animation controller called tarp. If we dive in here, we can see that we have this main file which is saved inside here. So here we have this animation file. So you simply drop that in here and you're already good to go. Uh, after which in the scene, you just drag that animation controller you made into this slot here. If we then hit play and go into our scene view, we can then see that the animation properly plays uh, like it did inside Houdini. Uh, so that's uh, it for the skinning converter. Let's take a look at another tool. So for the next tool, we're going to look at something brand new, which is called the LED Create tool. So the LED Create tool uh, allows you to uh, very easily create LED changes on sublevel uh, from game-ready geometry. So if you, for example, bring in a phot photogrammetry scan or uh, something from ZBrush, you would first use something called a GameRes, which is a tool that Louise will show later on, and that would be your LED zero, right? That's the game mesh you're going to use. Um, which you then plug into the LED create tool, which allows you to create LEDs. So to explain what LEDs are, I'm going to use a simple sphere. Uh, so LEDs, or level of details, are um, is basically decreasing the complexity of a mesh uh, as it moves away from the camera. So the further away uh, an object is from a camera, the less uh, big it is on screen, meaning the less detail you need to preserve uh, to get the same sort of look. Um, so to see that visualized, let's just plug that into the LED create. And we can now see that we have four different representations of our sphere lined up next to each other. So this is what the LED create tool did for us. So we have LED zero. This is what the user will see if they're really close to the object. And the further away you get, the lower um, the resolution or the complexity of this mesh gets. So about the tool itself, um, if you toggle this button on, on here, uh, you, it basically generates this layout next to each other. 
But let's take a look at a more realistic example. So we have this, uh, this car object here, and we want to generate LEDs for it. Because for some reason, maybe we're building uh, content for a mobile game. We need some LEDs for that. So we plug in our LED create tool, uh, which then gives us lots of settings to play with. So if you scroll down here, we can see that we have a mess estimation uh, setting, which allows us to tweak our LEDs. So on here, we can see that uh, we can specify for each LED what the percentage of triangles needs to be. Uh, so let's say for LED one, we don't want 50%, we just want 40%. Then we can change that to 40%, and we can now see that uh, it got reduced to 40%. So it's really easy in tweaking this. Uh, that's for mes mesh estimation. But the tool can also do uh, shader consolidation for you. Uh, what shader consolidation is, is essentially uh, the reduction of the number of draw calls by combining uh, materials into a simplified version. So this car here, uh, let's just turn off this for a second. This car has two materials in this case. We have one that has textures from disk, and we also have a procedural uh, texture applied here. So this procedural texture is essentially just uh, in a copnet. We have our, some noise here, and I applied that using the quick material node uh, using the op reference. So in this case, I just typed op and then op full path and then pointed to the, uh, the noise inside the copnet, which then applied it to my mesh here. Uh, so once you have that, so then when you decimate it or do the shader consolidation, it essentially merges all those uh, channels together that you assign using, for example, the quick material. So it will give you maps such as uh, base color, roughness, metallic, normal, and any other custom uh, channel you want to have. The tool can also generate imposters uh, for you, meaning that this tool basically brings you from uh, LOD zero all the way to the imposter level. But you can decide to not generate imposters by simply turning off last LOD's imposter. For the exporting, uh, we put all the, the convenience settings you're going to use a lot into a single tab, meaning that you have full control over where you export the geometry, uh, whether or not you want to extract source files, uh, source textures that have been applied. This is really useful if you're using uh, procedural uh, shaders inside Houdini because it will bake them out and save them out as uh, TGA files or whatever file type you want. Uh, same for the shader consultation and imposters. Uh, so the real cool thing um, of this tool as well is that it has a preset system, as you might have already seen. So let's just wait for that to calculate. This preset system essentially allows you to uh, build presets for all the settings you see in here, for example, for the mesh estimation. So if we select this preset here and we change it to, for example, distant object, we can now see that it changed the types of LEDs uh, to what has been defined in, dis in distant object preset. And the great thing is this is all uh, defined in uh, a JSON file. So if you edit this uh, LED create tool and go to the extra file section, you will see that you have this LED presets.json file which essentially has all these settings that uh, are saved on this parameter interface, meaning that if you, for example, rename this to something called a spooky Halloween car or something, and you hit apply, you will now have this preset here. This also means that you could, for example, load in an external JSON file uh, from uh, your pipeline and use that to, um, to play with. The tool also has a bunch of uh, debug settings. So if we, for example, enable our camera one, and we set this to keep pivot, uh, where it is, and we lock our camera. We can now see that if we enable debug camera, that the LOD will change based on uh, the camera distance. So if we change our preset again to a large object, we have more LEDs, meaning that if we get closer, we will get to see all our LEDs at once. But if we simply want to see these um, happening right here, we can use the visible LED slider, which allows us to just preview our LEDs right here. So it's a really convenient tool. Uh, we've seen some great uh, um, work with it already, and we're really looking forward to see uh, what you guys are going to do with it. Um, so how does that work when you export it out? Um, this is it. This is another model imported into Maya, which is a, a walker created by Christoph Des. And it's simply the FBX imported into Maya, um, meaning that it works straight away. And you can also still tweak uh, distance settings in here. And the same thing works for game engines such as Unity, Unreal, or your own proprietary engines. So real cool stuff. Um, so that's another tool that we looked at. For the next tool, we're going to look at uh, the Physics Painter tool. This is a tool that uh, we've spoken about in the past already, but we've made some great improvements uh, to the tool itself after some uh, user feedback and requests that you guys have done. Uh, so just to uh, rehash the tool, uh, Physics Painter is also an HTA that allows you to basically paint physics objects 
onto any other object uh, and then simulate gravity on those objects you painted. Um, once you do that, you basically dry the objects you simulated and then that allows you to paint over uh, that previous simulation and the mesh again. Uh, so you get lots of controls with these tools again, and at any given time, you're only literally a button press away from uh, creating something cool. So to see the tool in action, how do you set it up? Uh, we just drop down a physics painter tool. We plug in our scene. So in this case, we have a simple box here, and we hit the display flag on our physics painter. So that doesn't mean that we can paint yet. We, of course, need objects to paint with. So we do that by going to the objects tab and, and open the dynamics tab, which gives you this paint meshes object. Uh, so if we set this to two, we can now see that we have two slots where we can put objects. Uh, so just to, just to uh, show what the tool does, um, let's just use a box and a sphere in this case, and we're going to plug in those. So let's put the sphere in there, and let's put the box in there, set this to polygon mesh, and probably make this a bit smaller, and we're going to do the same thing for the box. If we then select our tool and uh, hit enter in the viewport, it now gives us our brush. And this brush now allows us to paint these objects onto the um, mesh itself. So once we now hit the up key or the right key, we can now see that it simulates. Uh, once we have a frame we like, we can just hit dry current paint. And we now convert all those dynamic objects into um, static objects, meaning that we can now paint on top of those again and continue painting. So we can do real cool stuff with this. Um, all by just hitting dry current paint. Uh, if we want to delete everything, we can just hit clear all paint. And if we want to remove the objects that we just painted, we can use clear current paint. So that just removes what you just painted. Um, let's take a look at uh, a cooler example. And we're going to look at uh, painting uh, pig heads. So since we need uh, 17, we have a new cool tool called uh, convex decomposition, which you'll get uh, straight out of the box from Houdini. And it allows you to basically take a complex object, so in this case, uh, this pig head, and if we were to use a convex hull, we can see that it doesn't really match um, match the pig head shape, right? As you can see, it has this sort of hole in here that we would like to remove. I just pressed W, by the way, to get into wireframe mode, if you're wondering. Uh, so we can use the convex decomposition node for that. And what it does is it essentially um, converts this mesh from a single a convex hull into multiple, meaning that you can have much more detail while still preserving the same uh, sort of performance that you get with a convex hull uh, mesh. So if we then use that in Physics Painter, uh, we can now see that the collision between objects has become a lot more precise because it actually uses the shape of the pig head that we defined using uh, the convex decomposition. So to use that, um, all we need to do is just point to the convex decomposition for the simulation mesh it will then use that object as the collision mesh for your simulation. Uh, that, of course, doesn't mean that it looks like your random mesh. Well, that is what the render mesh parameter is for. Uh, so if we enable that and we point it to the actual pig head, which hasn't been cut up using the convex decomposition, uh, we can then see that it uses that actual real mesh that we use as reference as the output. Uh, so then for a more uh, cool example, uh, because we want to do pretty stuff with it, of course, I imported these logs from uh, the Megascans library, and I also imported some uh, twigs, which we're going to paint. And now I'm going to show you the new cool stuff. So as you can see, I have uh, 50 objects assigned to my paint mesh here, and I'm going to paint all of those. But I don't want to simply paint uh, in a simple stroke, like we see here. We want to paint lots of stuff real quick, because we want to fill the scene with lots of um, twigs at the same time. So that is where this new uh, button comes in, this paint bucket mode. When you enable that and you hit enter, this, um, this pointer that you have, this brush with the sphere, if we hold shift and we drag left or right, we can basically control how big our brush is. We can also control how many bucket items we have, meaning that as soon as we hit a click, it will put 10 items into that volumetric brush we have. So uh, let's build some cool stuff with that. So as you can see, we can now simply drag uh, along these meshes and create something that looks really complex really quickly. Uh, we just simulate that, and we already have something really cool. So the improvement of this is that you can now build these really complex looking uh, scenes in one go instead of having to paint multiple times, um, meaning we'll probably see much more cool stuff from you guys. So once we dry that, uh, we now have a really cool scene again, all set up. Once you have that, we can then, for example, uh, export it out uh, to our game engine, or we can render it here inside Houdini. Lots of cool stuff. 
Uh, so that's it for uh, Physics Painter. But now we're going to look at something that is also brand new, uh, which is something that is about improving the UX that you as a user have inside Houdini. Um, and that is something called a viewport shaders. Uh, so the games team has been, like I said, uh, working on improving the overall UX that you as a user get inside Houdini. And part of this is, for example, the Marmoset drop, uh, which allows you to very easily create real-time renders and animations. But we're also working on improving the Houdini viewport itself. Uh, this is why we've been working on some real-time shaders, real-time as in here in Houdini, uh, for the viewport. Uh, so that's what I'm going to show you right now. Uh, let's see, it is loading. All right, there it is. And the first example that I'm going to show you is uh, a flow map. So you might already know the flow map tools uh, from Houdini, um, which can create really cool stuff. So this is what you would see beforehand, right? So this is what you would have, and you would use, for example, the uh, simple baker to bake this to a texture and bring that into a game engine um, to be used in your shader. But we've made that work in the viewport itself. So let's just look at this simple example. We have a grid, we applied a mountain to it, um, we did a soft transform to sort of create this slope. And then on the flow map node itself, uh, these tools also have lots of updates. I won't cover all of them in this video. Uh, but as you can see, I simply put the slope, which is a new option. And that will essentially look at the slope of this mesh and generate uh, this base flow map from it. Then with a guide, in this case, uh, this curve, I basically uh, generated more uh, of a direction. So if we visualize that and turn off these other guys, we can see that it used that guide to, um, to generate the direction from it, right? So we use that curve to generate a direction. Let's put that back to slope. Uh, so now we see that we used the guide. Then what I did is I used uh, obstacles. So we have this cool scene, which has lots of rocks, and we want those rocks to affect the flow map itself. That is what you do with the flow map obstacle. Uh, then I added the second obstacle, which is this object in the middle of the river. And then I used the flow map brush converted that to color, and then now we get to the real cool tool. So this is the flow map visualize. This is the new stuff. If you merge that and we hit play, we can now see that we have that flow map working in real time in the viewport. So this allows you to uh, tweak this flow map without having to export it first. So if you, for example, take this brush, uh, we can now literally paint on our flow map and see that working in the viewport. So this means that your uh, speed of iteration has become a lot faster and also allows you to very easily tweak stuff. For example, this rock, if I don't like the flow around it, we can just change that here in the viewport itself without having to export it out as a texture first into a game engine. So the tool itself, uh, it's actually a, a shop net. It's a shader in the shop net. So if we dive inside this flow map visualize, we can see that it essentially is, it brings in the grid that we have and it promotes your UVs from vertex to points, which is what the shader needs from you. Then with a the material node, you can simply assign the shader that we generated, which is saved inside the shop net. So that is what you see here. This is the actual viewport shader that we're uh, seeing uh, working in the viewport right now, and it's all based on GLSL. So if you want to modify this code or want to use it as reference, all you do is you simply click on type properties, and you go to the code tab. And this shows you all the different shaders that you have here. So the vertex shader, the fragment shader, and the geometry shader. So in this case, uh, for the flow map example, um, the fragment shader is what you would want to edit. And to see that code, uh, it's, it looks really scary. Uh, but what we did is we, we cleaned up uh, the examples that Houdini provides by default uh, so that it's easy to modify and learn from. So we have these input parameters here. Uh, then we have some uh, parameters. So this is what you see on the user interface. We ha then have some custom functions that we created. We have our main function. So this is what's happening all the time when rendering. And this is where our logic is placed. So this is the code for our flow map shader. So if you have your own logic for a flow map shader that you use in your game engine, uh, you might want to, for example, port that into the shader itself so that you have an exact result between engine and Houdini itself. And then here at the bottom, what it does, it assigns the outputs. So Houdini basically knows how to render and what to render. Uh, so that's it for the, uh, for the flow map example. Uh, we hope that you do real cool stuff with it and hope that it improves your uh, iteration speed. So that's the first example. But like I said, uh, we're constantly working on improving it and building more of these. We also built the texture sheets uh, example. So people love texture sheets and they love motion uh, vectors. So why not have that working in the viewport as well? Uh, so if we enable that, we can now see that we have this motion vector uh, tool working in the viewport in real time. 
So there we go. And this now also gives us full control over the speed. Uh, if we want to make it really slow, we can now properly see the blending that happens with the motion vectors. Uh, you can apply or not apply double motion vectors to see how that results look. So usually we use double motion vectors because it does a better result. Uh, you can specify the number of rows and columns. So if your uh, texture sheet has eight times eight uh, sprites, change that number. And it also allows you to change the distortion number. Uh, but the default is usually uh, what you want to have. Uh, so that's it for the viewport shader. Uh, like I said, there is many more coming, for example, for the uh, Photix animation textures so that you can directly see those in the viewport and also for imposters, which means that you can very easily see those, uh, for example, use them in crowd workflows, uh, but also see them in the LOD tools. And uh, that's it for me for now. Um, on to you, Luis. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, yeah, so that was awesome. And then the, the other note that we I like to say is that all of these demos are live, so expect horrible things to happen. Um, Paul crushed it, and nothing bad happened. Um, but we still have Paul, or Mike, and myself to mess things up. So um, on with the show. I'm going to be talking about um, three tools. Uh, the first one is the Reality Capture plugin. So Reality Capture, for those that aren't familiar, is a photogrammetry software. Um, so we have a plugin that basically lets you run Reality Capture inside of Houdini. Um, I'll go through that workflow. After that, I'll talk about the game res node that Paul mentioned. And the idea there is we have this mesh pipeline um, that goes from a high res asset all the way down to a LOD one or LOD zero um, automatically. Um, we'll go through that. And then finally, I'll show the Mapbox um, node, which is a combination of OSM import and um, satellite and uh, color or height information for anywhere around the world. So we'll, we'll go through those in a little bit. Um, so to start off, um, I have a empty scene, um, almost empty scene of Houdini. And I'm gonna start by uh, just going through and seeing uh, the reality capture node. So as of last night's build, um, we've moved the reality capture plugin to be a part of the game dev tools. So before you had to kind of run a separate installer, uh, but now they should just come with um, Houdini itself or the, the game dev tools. So there's five nodes, um, align images, create models, extract cameras, register images and texture model. So we start off with uh, register images and all this node does is basically takes um, a series of images. In this case, there's this Apple data set that we provide um, for you guys as well. Um, so we can just hit open. And this is simply, it's just a multi-parm that just has all of the different images um, in a list that actually stores those as a detail attribute um, on this node, which then will pass over to the next nodes. Um, so I'm actually gonna do the next step, which is aligning the cameras um, live. Um, it's going to take a little bit, but um, I'll talk through it. Um, so if we do align images, um, this is what the node looks like. Um, by default, it's not going to do anything um, because we've added this ability of doing manual mode. Uh, so before um, reality capture would basically just start cooking immediately and then Houdini would lock up for however long reality capture needs to do its work. And that kind of felt really bad. So um, this is a non-traditional Houdini thing, um, but we're starting to try it out to where now there's this manual mode built into the nodes themselves. Um, traditionally, we have those um, just here in the bottom where you can kind of set it from auto update to manual. Uh, but now you can turn that off and it will just run away and do its thing, or we can um, um, turn it on. So the other thing that you'll see, actually, um, we also enabled caching. So if you see, um, I didn't even have to compute anything, but I'll compute it anyway. So I'll just kick this off um, so we can see it um, running as I'm talking. Um, the first thing that you do if you drop this node and then you get an error, um, if you middle mouse click, you sometimes will say fail to load license. So what you need to do is you click this button that says get license and this will launch the reality capture website that you can just type in your um, credentials and then use your license. So this works with all of the regular reality capture licenses except the Steam one, um, including the kind of demo or promo, the, the, the less expensive one. Um, so feel free to use it. The, the thought there was that if you have Reality Capture, you shouldn't have to pay for it again, um, just to use a plugin. So if you see, um, it already registered all of my 59 images. And here I have a point cloud. Um, in this case, we can middle mouse over it to see how many. So it's 194,000 points um, just for the kind of sparse cloud. Um, after here, we would create the model. Um, I'm not going to do this because this does take a while. Um, for this model, I think in my machine it takes around 10 minutes, which is still not awful compared to what people are used to waiting for photogrammetry. Um, but I do have the result here cached. So we can see um, here we have that same uh, point cloud. Let me hide the other objects. And then we can see the model loaded. 
Um, if you can see here, we actually show how many uh, triangles it has. Um, it has 9 million points um, for this apple, so it's a pretty dense apple. Um, and it's just using vertex color. So here we can see this is actually the wireframe. So if we go all the way in, you can start seeing the resolution that we have. Um, so it's pretty incredible and pretty fast to use. Um, super simple, like even if you don't know Houdini, um, these tools are designed for you to just kind of hop in and do stuff. Um, some of the attributes here, um, the ability to colorize the models, whether or not you want vertex colors, um, the ability of uh, maxing the poly count. So I'll touch on this in a second, but reality capture can easily give you uh, like a hundred million polys that the Houdini viewport might not handle. So you have the ability of just cl clamping that and saying by default, nothing more than 50 million. That's, that's good enough for me. Um, or you have the ability of kind of decoupling the internal reality capture model from the Houdini display model. So in this case, we can uh, basically say the max display poly count is going to be something, but we're still going to have in memory the original reality capture model. So you can see here where I say reality capture model has how many triangles? Um, that's the kind of internal one. So even if uh, Houdini is telling you something else, um, this is telling you what under the hood is happening. Um, so now I'm going to hop over to a slightly more complicated scene um, that I ran through yesterday. So here again, um, adding the images, um, only 21 images to generate this guy. Um, here we have the alignment. So the alignment is actually going to give me a lot more uh, points. Let me just hide. If you want to hide the background image, we can hide those here. Let's set this to dark. Um, so we can see, so it actually generated some, what we expect, like it picked up some of the background information that we might not want. So I'm just using regular Houdini tools here to basically um, delete everything that is not my selection. And then I want to generate a access align bounding box of that selection. So I feed that as the second input into the create model, which is going to give me in this case, a 7 million poly um, statue. So here again, we can go into wireframe and see all of the fancy detail. Um, and this is not super fancy. You can see there's a lot of baked in lighting, uh, which we have some tools to get rid of. Um, but what we can do now is um, one of the common questions was um, if I want to generate a texture out of this. So a lot of people just don't care and they'll just use the, the vertex colors. In that case, you can just use regular Houdini pipelines. So like here, we're going to clip uh, the floor. Uh, we're going to delete the small parts. So there's a couple of kind of these fringy explodey bits. And then we're going to run that game res node that I'll talk in a second. Um, so here we're actually looking at, I think 15,000. Yeah. So 15,000 tries um, automatically generated from the photogrammetry. So I didn't really have to do any work. Um, but I baked the color from the vertex colors. And then sometimes people are like, well, if my model wasn't good enough, sometimes I like to generate an actual texture from reality capture. So how would I do that? Um, so that's what this other chain is. So, you don't want to generate the texture on the full 7 million points just because it's kind of overkill. So what we can do is you can actually chain two reality capture create model nodes together. And if we turn on this use inputs model data, um, instead of recalculating it from the cameras, it's just going to take the model data from this guy and then do a decimation. So in this case, I'm dropping it down to 500,000 points and then I'm running that texture model node, um, which is going to give me the, the texture model. Um, in this case, it's going to actually also give me the option of a model path. So this is basically dumping this out to this. So I'm basically um, dumping out an 8K texture with an OBJ. So if I do want to bake just the textures from um, the photogrammetry itself, um, you have that option. And then you can bake your normal map, your human inclusion, and all your other data um, from your high res. Um, so that's it for the reality capture plugin. Um, it's really fairly straightforward to use. Um, one limitation that we do have is we don't have support for control points. Um, that's a common requested feature that we're going to look into adding. Um, but uh, so expect that to come in the somewhat near future, we're working with the reality capture team on how to best um, integrate that in. Uh, but the thought here is if you have lots and lots of props, you can definitely use this pipeline. If you have one single prop that you kind of need to finagle a lot, reality capture is still better for that. So the idea of using Houdini in that pipeline is if you have lots of models that you kind of want to churn through that pipeline. Um, so now let's go get to a little bit deeper into this game res node. Uh, let me just check my notes to make sure. Yeah, I got all, all the notes. Um, the other node that I had um, was the extract cameras, which we can try to see if this will work. Uh, it might not because I'm improvising. Um, so if we funnel this in from it, that actually works. Um, so if we use this extract cameras, um, we would just chain it from the aligned images and um, we can actually get the camera positions 
of the, the photogrammetry scan. Um, we don't have rotations yet, um, and that's kind of a Quaternion math nightmare of getting things from reality capture space into Houdini space, um, but we're working on that problem. And, but for now, you definitely have all the positions and um, at least you can kind of see which ones aligned and which ones didn't. So, okay, back to the schedule. Um, we'll look into the game res node. Um, so the game res node is something that we've been working on for close to two years at this point. Um, it's made up of lots of different parts. So what it does is it will automatically reduce your mesh, um, including some options for adding voxelization and actually using a quad remesher um, called instant meshes. It would also auto UV your mesh. So we have multiple different uh, techniques that we can um, go through in a little bit. Um, and then you actually do your baking as well. So this goes from um, a high res mesh into a game res um, in a few minutes, um, depending on your bake quality. So I'm gonna open up a new scene and we're gonna try to run through um, a quick example uh, live. So uh, that's not what I wanted to grab. So let's fire up a new empty Houdini, which I already had ready. So this one doesn't have anything as just a regular node. Uh, we're gonna drop in a file node and I am going to load in um, this Nike model that I downloaded off uh, the internet. So this is just actually the STL. So it's not even cleaned up. I wanted to do the cleanup step here. Um, if you can see, it comes in rotated. And if I disable my uh, back face calling, you'll actually see that it's also inside out. So this is generally what you might get out of uh, a scan data. So to fix the inside out, we just drop in a reverse node and we funnel that in. And then to rotate it, we just drop in a transform node and we rotate it by negative 90. So now we have our model kind of back where it needs to be. Uh, the model count for this is 500,000 polys. So the idea here is you can, I'm, I use photogrammetry because it's easy, um, but you can easily do this with a ZBrush model or a Maya model or a Mudbox or wherever you're coming from. Um, so now we'll drop in that game res node. Um, the one change that I will make is I will change the bake size. So just for our times. Um, so instead of a 250 or it's a 2k texture, I'm baking uh, 256 and here you can see just by turning on the visibility, it already ran off and started cooking. It already did the decimation at this point it's packing. And after this, it's going to start uh, baking. So the bake hopefully will take around 30 ish seconds um, because it's a low texture, but that's really all there's to it. Um, we'll go through some of the settings here when it kind of comes back up. Um, but this is, this basically took us a few years of starting with Houdini 16. We rewrote our poly reduction. Um, we've, you've been seeing us rewrite a lot of the, all the, the UV tools. So the new UV layout, the new UV flatten that's been rewritten twice um, since 2016. And sticking, there it goes. So then um, once it's done, it will actually um, do all of the setup for you. So in this case, it loaded in my model. It also loaded in the normal map and the textures. Um, this, don't worry too much about it. This is actually a viewport bug in Houdini to where if it gets too close to the edge, we start getting some of this banding. Um, I have the model up here um, also that I can show you guys um, when it gets baked at a higher res that I'll show in a second. Um, so the nice thing is for the auto UV, we already had an auto UV that you can just use um, by typing in auto UV. Um, but we added the UV auto seam technique that is new in 17. So before 17, this model was a nightmare to try to get UVs. Um, so if we look at the UVs, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Um, the thought here is this is not gonna be necessarily your final game res model. If you're doing a VR experience that you don't really care about the, the UVs, you're just baking things out, this is perfectly shippable if you bake at a higher res. Um, but if you are kind of going in and you wanna optimize everything and you like to see your UV shells and recognize them, you might wanna go in and clean this up or kind of um, do manual UVs. But the thought is you only do that once per project, right? Is you get the, your asset in from ZBrush, you iterate, you get art director feedback, you get design feedback, you loop on that 30 times until you actually have the model you want. And then once you have that, then that's when you spend your time going through a topology tool and a UV tool. Um, so before this just would fail horribly, um, we can actually visualize the different parts of the pipeline here. So if we turn on UVs, there's just one little part that it kind of doesn't do a great job at, um, so we're still working on that. But for the most part, it gives you pretty clean, um, non-distorted UVs uh, for most of it, which is what we want. Um, on the reduction tab, we and then here there's settings on basically how which technique do you want to use, and we have videos on it. Um, if you want to merge small islands, which flattening method. So it's, this is just kind of standard um, UV uh, workflows. 
So on the reduction, you can clearly say how many uh, inverts you want. In this case, 50,000. Um, I'm actually going to check this use instant meshes because I like um, this is going to give us a quadri mesh. Um, so instant mesh is a open source quadri mesher that if you have uh, the executable in your my documents Houdini 17 path, it will just pick it up and use it. Um, so here it's going to kind of go off and, and do the packing. Um, wow. Well, okay. So it actually gave me back. So this will actually give you um, pretty nice uh, quad topology. Still not perfectly. Um, it has some uh, continuation issues um, that hopefully we'll address. Uh, but then we can kind of go in and see the, the final model. So I do have the final model baked out in Marmoset. So this is the, the same model uh, baked with a 4K texture. So you can see this, even though it is kind of a completely uh, automated pipeline, it still holds up. And if you put this on a website or if you put this on Sketchfab or even put it in your game as a block out or even final art, like if you're gonna be UVing rocks and all these other assets that you might not necessarily care about, um, you should spend the time really focusing on your hero assets. Um, so that's the, the game rest pipeline. Um, it's relatively straightforward to use. Um, a lot of people have been using it in production, so hopefully um, you guys are using it and enjoying it. And any questions, I'll be able to kind of uh, help you guys out in the, the next uh, session. So then, um, so that's it for the game rest tool. And let's open a new scene. And next we're gonna go into Mapbox. So for those that are not familiar, Mapbox is a map provider. Um, they do a lot of work with kind of cars and uh, different industries, uh, but they do have an API for downloading map data and kind of browsing the world. So um, if we drop in the Mapbox node, um, which is, is already live, but we haven't really made a video of it because we're kind of holding out to show you guys in this webinar. Um, so here there's going to be a slot for your Mapbox API key. If you sign up for free, um, you can just plug it in here. Um, I have a preset that will set my key for me. Um, there is a licensing associated with it if you want to use it for commercial purposes. Um, if you want to talk to them, there's a button here to contact them and um, work with them on it. Uh, but if you want to just use it and kind of play around with it, you can hit this lookup button and that's going to give me a browser of the world and I can literally go anywhere in the world and I will download the data for the terrain, uh, the height maps, the colors and the OSM data for it. So I like to start off with somewhere in the Grand Canyon because it has really, really big um, steep areas. So Grand Canyon National Parks over here. Uh, we can keep zooming in. Um, you can see if you just download this, it will get this image and it will kind of without the, the markings and apply that. But if you kind of keep going in um, after some point, you can actually even get um, pretty close resolution. So this might be too close. So I actually want somewhere here and let's just hit download. So this is not cache. This is just me downloading it. Um, I said it's going to dry on, download the height information, the image, and then the OSM data. So let's check it out what it's doing. And hopefully, so now it's doing loading everything up. It already downloaded. We hit spacebar F. You'll see that part of the world um, loaded. So there it is. You will see that there is some copyright information and the Mapbox logo on your images. So that's to kind of discourage you from using this um, on a commercial project. So I would recommend just talking to them and, and working out a deal. Um, but this is the kind of dream. So we had OSM data for a little bit. And what OSM data is, is essentially this. Um, it is um, curves for the whole world. So we have, even on areas that there's no roads or buildings, you still get a lot of information um, from OSM. Um, but once the next step, the next logical step was actually getting in the height and the color information. So um, the workflow, instead of trying to line these up by hand and downloading them from two different websites and trying to line up latitudes and longitudes and circumference of the world. Um, I just wanted to have a browser that I select the area that I want and then I hit download and I'm done. Um, so that's the tool that we have here. Um, as you saw, the first input or the first output is um, the, the height field. Um, you can actually change it to be polygons if you want polygons instead of the height fields. The resolution is uh, 248 um, per square for whatever you download. So if you download the whole state of Florida or a tiny little space, you're gonna get a 2K texture for it. Um, and then you can actually merge in the terrain with the OSM data. So you can kind of see where they line up and it's actually pretty close or it's, it's dead on. Um, we can offset the terrain a little bit or the curves from the terrain. So you can actually see that 
we have some of the markings of where the cliffs are, some of the ridges. Um, so it's pretty damn awesome. Um, and then you also have the rivers and all the paths. So this is great for a terrain piece, but let's go to a city. Um, so if we load up our image again, it's going to remember where we were. And I want to go somewhere in Austin because uh, I used to live there for a while. And I generally remember the area. Uh, so let's go this way, this way, Albuquerque, make a ride in Albuquerque. And went too far. So there, Austin. So I'm going to go to Lake Travis for those that are in the area. Um, there's a dam, Mansfield Dam, that I'm going to kind of go around and just pull that area. So this is the area that I want. This is the dam. This is um, the island. There's some houses over here. I'm just going to hit download. And it's going to do the same process that it did. Um, it's going to get the information. So you see, I'm being sloppy. I'm not really caring um, where it is. And it's going to give me exactly what I want. So that's the beauty of live demos. Um, hopefully, it will just work. Um, but if it doesn't, I have some backups. Um, so here it is. Um, obviously, the height differences are not as drastic as the Grand Canyon, but you still get um, so like where the dam is, you can see that there is a height difference of where the dam is. Um, and then we also get some data here for the houses um, and we can just isolate these and um, some of the some of the roads. So what we can do here is I like these houses and it's kind of cool. I want them in 3D. So we have this node for OSM buildings that we can just funnel in from the null into it. And this is going to give you um, little extrusions for the, the terrain. So if we merge that back in and we remove that offset from 10 back to zero, um, we kind of put them back on the ground. Um, nicely enough, a lot of the buildings in this area already had height information, um, but if you don't, you can actually generate buildings on missing data. Um, so if you see now it's going to actually generate a few more and these are just going to be randomly from 10 meters to 30 meters. So it's kind of up to you to, depending on your city, what you want to guess. Um, but ideally the city already has a lot of the data for you. Um, so let's look at a bigger city. And this was the kind of image that we showed on the webinar. So, so this is what New York looks like. Um, and again, this is the same node, right? I just chose the coordinates for New York. I hit download. It's a little bit more data. So I chose to cache it. Uh, the nice thing about New York is that it does have not only the buildings, it actually has building parts and we know how to handle that data. So a lot of these buildings, so like Empire State is actually a tiered building over here. Um, so we actually get a lot of that information just straight out of OSM. So we don't need to do a lot of the guessing data. A lot of the guessing work comes in from like Jersey City and Brooklyn and Queens um, where some of the data might not be present, but um, that's what the, the OSM looks like. Uh, the other note that I've added, and I don't think I've checked this in yet, but it's going to go in um, tonight, is this OSM filter node. Um, so the OSM data has a lot of stuff in it. So it has subways, it has roads, it has, uh, if you want to get down, it sometimes has parking meters. So the filter node lets you basically isolate just the areas that you want. Um, of course, you can go in the attributes. Um, if we look here in the geometry spreadsheets, on the primitives, there's literally hundreds of these attributes. Um, from names, from um, where they are, if there's a bar in them, there's all sorts of crazy data that um, it's marked up and we just ingest all of it so you can use it. Um, but there's some key ones like buildings um, and then roads. So there's different types of roads. So there's primary, secondary. Um, you can kind of see it as it's coming up. So footways, pedestrians, um, other, and then um, other data, just the other kind of stuff that is not, I, I think there's like in New York, there's ferry, um, tracks and everything. Um, so it lets you filter it a little bit more. So if you don't want, if you want to do a map or something, um, or if you don't want to use the OSM buildings, you want to do something custom to actually take the footprints and then rent it on a farm and kind of generate the footprints themselves, um, you can do that. Um, but that's it. So the Mapbox node is live. You can download it. Um, you can play with it. Um, of course, contact them if you're interested in licensing this or using it on a project. But if you just want to play around with it for non-commercial, um, knock yourself out and um, go anywhere in the world and pick it. Um, so now that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Mike. That's going to bring us home. Thanks, Louise. Um, I just wanted to point something out because I don't know how many people watching this know this, but the reason we're all streaming separate video streams, um, I don't know if Chris mentioned this, is because we're all in different cities. So Louise is in uh, in Miami, correct? Um, correct. Close enough. And, yeah. 
yeah, Paul is in LA and I'm in Toronto. So uh, we, we are literally a global team working on this stuff. Uh, okay, so um, enough uh, talking, let's get to the fun stuff. Um, I'm gonna be showing some stuff which has been around for a while, but um, if you're new to, um, oh great, who would ask me for to work, okay. Um, if you are new to Houdini, then this stuff might uh, be less familiar. So um, let's begin here. So the first thing I want to talk about uh, is imposters. Uh, Paul touched briefly on this idea in the, the LOD tool because you can actually have as your, your final uh, LOD uh, an imposter, which essentially is a sprite. Uh, instead of dealing with all the geometry of something, you just have a single card with a texture on it, uh, which updates based on the angle. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to set that up and then also show some updates to the animation imposters specifically. Uh, so what I've got here is uh, just a really simple uh, run cycle of um, a crowd character. Um, and to set up an imposter, you need two things. If you go to your out context, uh, and I should probably point this out because I do this quite quickly. Um, just a little note, if you ever need to add a, a shortcut or a, a key binding to something that's in one of your, your menus, uh, you can actually go uh, click on it uh, with Control, Shift, and Alt. So for instance, if I wanted to add a, a shortcut key for chops, uh, then what that will do is if I click on that with Control, Shift, and Alt, it'll bring up the hotkey manager already set to that, and then you can just add in your, your hotkey for that uh, option. Um, and the reason I'm showing you that is because I actually use that to jump between object materials as well as uh, cops and the render nodes. So if you're wondering how I'm doing that, that's how I am doing it. Uh, so the first thing I need in my art context is uh, the game dev imposter texture uh, node. And uh, just for the sake of kind of going through some of the stuff, um, I will retype this. Um, and uh, Paul was kind enough to add to this for us uh, the ability to handle octahedral imposters, which uh, Ryan Brux called out in a post from Epic a while ago. Um, and it's a little bit more efficient way of dealing with uh, imposters. Uh, so that's the first thing that I need. And I'm going to point this at my mocap uh, geo. Uh, so I'm just gonna grab that there. Uh, and then I also need a camera rig. So for the camera rig, I'm gonna jump back to my art cont uh, object context and drop down an imposter camera rig. And I'll just rename this as well, octahedral rig. And this is a little funny, but basically you need to point this at the out uh, at ROP and then the ROP at this. So I'll do it that way around first. Um, I'm pointing this at the octahedral imposter and then I'll jump that way around. And in here I go to camera rig and I'm gonna set that to uh, this guy over here. So I just want to kind of show you what's happening a little bit uh, under the hood. Uh, I'll set this to hemioctahedron and drop it down to 1024. Um, and if I go to my render view, uh, then what I can do is I can essentially see what this is going to look like. So there's a bunch of different um, render nodes available. In this case, I'm going to have a look at the um, octahedral one. And the cool thing with this is we have a lens shader, which essentially renders the same object from multiple angles all in one go. Uh, so instead of having to, to wait for multiple renders for each frame, it'll actually take care of the whole thing in, in one file swoop, which is pretty cool. Uh, so this is what an imposter texture would look like, and then this you would hook up uh, in your, your game engine. Uh, so that's just a quick kind of overview of, of what the imposters are. Uh, what I wanted to show specifically today uh, has to do with some updates to the animation uh, imposters because that did have to be done uh, as single frames, which took some time and, and wasn't the greatest. So uh, what I have here is um, still this, uh, the same animation. Uh, I have a, a camera rig already set up. And then uh, I also have a game day of imposter textures um, uh, ROP, and this is set to animation. And uh, the cool thing is now, uh, if I go to render view, uh, we've kind of combined two things here. So uh, there is now a specific uh, ROP for that, which is the imposter render uh, animation lens. And basically what that's going to do is it's going to give me a render for the specific frame 
uh, from a number of different angles around the, the object, uh, which will look like this. We'll let that load up. Ah, uh, there we go. Louise uh, jinxed it. Uh, let's see if we can bring that back up quickly. So while that's loading up, um, Chris, do we have any questions that we might want to answer uh, while this is loading? Uh, there's a bunch of questions. Um, we've been answering some along the way in the Q&A area. But um, I'm trying to use erosion sim, for example. I think we'll keep on going and then we'll save some questions for the end. I think we'll do it all at once. No worries. Uh, this loaded up pretty quickly, so we should be good. Uh, okay, let's see if this decides not to crash on me this time. Um, so what I wanted to point out was uh, if I come here and I hit render, uh, let's see how this goes. There we go. Okay, so what you're seeing now essentially is a, a render around the, the character from a number of different angles uh, for that specific frame. So if I was to step forward a frame, you can see it now updates and, and does that. So essentially what I can do uh, when I hit render here is it will do as many of these as there are uh, frames, um, which is here, the animation frames, one to 16, and then it'll composite that all together. So my final texture looks uh, something like, not that one there, let's see if we can find it over here, uh, will look like this. Uh, um, base color. And that is loading somewhere, let's see if we can find it. Um, so, I forgot to load my light, which is why I'm not getting any uh, beauty coming through. Uh, actually, no, I'm reloading the wrong one. Let's do this guy over here. Preview. And we'll let that load up. There we go. So this is the texture that it, it's generated. So now I can take this into my game engine, uh, apply it to a sprite, and then using some shader magic, we can, we can choose which one of those images we want. So you probably saw when this crashed, I already have something loaded up to, to show you. So let me go and grab that quickly. Um, and uh, basically, uh, if we have a look at this, um, we can use it in a number of different ways. So this is the imposter being used. Um, oh, struggling a bit. So we can do that again. Uh, where I have the sprite attached to a particle system and I can do kind of cheap crowds in the background. So as I move around, and hopefully this doesn't uh, fail me, uh, you can see that we're getting the correct angle uh, for that object. Um, and the way that I set that up, um, I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the shader specifically, uh, but I'll kind of show you uh, a little bit about it. Um, is, like I said, it's, it's basically taking the camera position to the particle position, figuring out that angle, uh, and then based on that, picking one of the textures um, in the, uh, the sprite sheet or in the texture sheet. Um, if you want to know more about this, I'd suggest checking out uh, Ryan Brooks's post, and I think um, Epic does have a, a, a blue, um, plugin uh, content, content plugin that will give you some more information as well as, as to how that works. So that's just very quickly um, something uh, that you might want to use. You can either use it for static uh, textures uh, or, or static objects or animated objects. Um, and it's, it's relatively quick to do. You saw that the, the render itself for a st um, static one was almost immediate. This takes, I would say, about a minute to generate. Um, and then, of course, we also do provide the option for base color and normal. So if you want to recreate this with uh, in-game lighting, uh, then it'll handle that as well. So that's imposters. Um, let's jump on to the next one. And we're going to be looking at, uh, let's see, let's have a look at some RBD workflow stuff. So if you haven't had a chance to play with 17 yet, uh, I recommend you check it out. We've got a bunch of new tools specifically for RBD and fracturing. Um, and before 17 came out, we were already looking at how we can improve uh, the overall RBD workflow. There's some already uh, great shelf tools that can help you set up some of these things. 
Uh, but what we wanted to do was see if we could kind of encapsulate some of these ideas that are done over and over and over again. Uh, so I'll let this load. Um, so I think there are three parts to crafting a destruction sequence. There's your fracturing of the geometry. There's the, the, the directing of what happens to those fractured pieces, when they get activated, how they get hit. And then there's the solver itself. So taking that idea, we wanted to kind of provide three nodes to, to handle that. Um, so what I've got here is uh, just a, a little model to, to kind of test this out with. Um, and previously, we would have used uh, the RBD fracture node, which is part of the, the game dev tool, uh, which was kind of like a stopgap. You're still more than welcome to use it. Uh, but what we now have, which is super cool, uh, is the RBD material uh, fracture presets. Now, this is a, a new node 217. It's basically a wrapper for a bunch of great stuff. Uh, it can do um, presets for concrete, wood, and glass. Uh, so not necessarily game dev specific, but we wanted to make sure that it worked with the game dev tools. Uh, so to give you an idea, if I plug this guy in, uh, it takes a little while to, to initialize. Um, and then I'll put down an explode node so we can see what's going on. Uh, explode. Come on. So you can see that we've uh, we've now got a doubling of images. Let's hide that guy, and then we can see what's happening. Uh, so the the material uh, fracture does recursive um, fracturing. Uh, in this case, it's doing two levels of uh, fracturing. So I'm just going to increase this to say 30 scatter points um, for the the base level, and then what it's doing is for each of those 30 pieces, it's randomly picking ones and dividing them up into even more pieces. So you get a much better look, I think, than just a, a standard Voronoi fracture. Um, the other thing I might want to do as well is uh, let's just um, have a look at uh, the actual volume that's being used to scatter the points. And right now it's scattering points kind of in these areas over here. But what I'd like it to do is just be a little bit more even in its scattering. So I'm just going to increase the, the noise frequency. Uh, I think by two should be okay. Let's see if that gives me something I'm happy with. And I apologize, my laptop is going as fast as it can to provide these images. Uh, there we are. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I might just move the noise down a little bit. Um, and then that's going to be used to scatter the points and then fracture up uh, the geometry. Okay. Uh, so let's hide that again. And we'll get rid of that. And we'll have a look at this. And so you can now see that we're getting some, some kind of interesting fractures. So uh, this is all pretty standard. Now, the, the important part to this really is the, the game dev tools that we want to show. And that's the RBD director and the RBD solver. And the idea behind this is this would be used for your kind of uh, more simplified uh, destruction pieces where uh, you just need to get it out as quickly as possible. Uh, you don't have to do anything too complex. You want to fracture it up, maybe activate some pieces and then, and then spit it out. So um, for that, uh, like I said, we have the RBD director and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a second. And then we have the RBD solver. So all these are really are just wrappers around a bunch of stuff that you might want to do yourself. Um, in fact, I don't want to include that. I want to put that in there. Uh, a note on the RBD material fracture, it has a couple of outputs. The one on the left is for your uh, export to render geometry. And the one on the right is your proxy or collision geo. And the idea here is that you can actually uh, noise up your export geo for interior detail and edge detail. But then for your uh, collision geometry, which generally you want to be a convex hull, uh, it'll keep that as, as convex ge geo. So with that all being said, um, let me just uh, show you what I've got. I put down the director and the solver. Uh, and if I hit play, um, there we go. Uh, we're doing a basic simulation. So what this is doing is uh, it's, it's setting up all kind of the attributes that you need for a, for a um, an RBD simulation. And the RBD director is really what we care about because it includes a bunch of cool things that allows you to activate at a specific frame. It allows you to use volumes to decide what gets activated if you want something to add a force to. It kind of encapsulates all that stuff that you might want to play with. 
Um, and uh, just to kind of save time, I've already set some of this up so that we can go through it. Um, but you saw there dropping down the nodes uh, and, and getting started really doesn't take too much time. Uh, so this is almost identical in its uh, setup. Uh, we take that same uh, statue, uh, I'm fracturing it up using the RBD material fracture. And the settings on this, by the way, are, are identical to the other one. Uh, and you're probably saying, well, then why don't you just use the other one, Mike? Uh, it's a good point. Um, so what I want to show here um, is I'm going to go through a couple of different ways you can use the RBD director. So first thing I'm going to show you is exactly the same as what you had before. Um, essentially what this is doing is the RBD director is set to activate at frame 19. So everything will start uh, simulating as part of this object at frame 19. But let's say that I want to uh, stage it a little bit better. I want to have half of it fall a little sooner and then the other half fall a little bit later. Well, what I can actually do uh, is I can put down a, a bounding object. This can be any geometry essentially. Uh, and that can actually be plugged into the RBD director. So I've got a second RBD director here. So these can actually chain together. And um, I've plugged this in and then I've actually set the, the frame to activate at frame 10. And what that means is everything in this area will start at 10 and then everything in the other area will be at frame 19. So if we have a look at how that now works, um, and we play it again, you'll see at frame 10, the one side starts falling down and at frame 19, the other side starts falling down. So this is a really quick way uh, for, for setting this stuff up. And then just showing one more thing about this, you can also use that same uh, bounding object uh, to create a volume and then add a force. So if I was to turn on create force from objects on the RBD director and play this again, uh, you'll actually get something which is now kind of uh, pushing. You'll notice that some of the pieces are essentially being pushed uh, to the right. Uh, and that's because that I'm, I'm adding a force to it. Um, so I think to maybe make this a little clearer, I'll just move this over to the other side so you can see. Uh, we'll probably get everything exploding all over the place now, but that's fine. Um, let's see what this does. There we go. So that is now picking up from the SDF that's created from that object, uh, a direction, and then it's adding that as a force to that object. I'm going to move that back into position. So there's one other thing that you might want to know about the RBD director, and that's to do with animated objects. So I've actually got a, a sphere here that I want to use as a collider. I want to basically drive it through, um, my, my simulation and, um, the way that I do that is once again, just another RBD director, um, except I've set the type to animated. And so what this will do is it will take animated information in, uh, and at a certain frame, we can switch it over to using um, uh, a dynamic object. So remember that at 19 was when we kind of had stuff falling down. So at frame 18, I'm going to do it the other way around. Um, and if I now play this, you'll see we get the first part falling. And then we get that blasting through. So in very little time, I think you can start crafting your simulations to do some interesting things. Um, and like I said, the purpose of this is to handle um, some of your more simple stuff. We'd like to keep adding to this. At some point, constraints would be a part of it. Uh, but for now, this is kind of just the, the, the initial um, setup. Um, uh, okay. So uh, that's just a little bit about the RBD director, RBD solver, uh, and then a very brief intro into the RBD material fracture. Um, so the next thing I want to look at uh, has, has probably been around as one of the, the oldest game dev tools we've had, and that is the vertex animation textures. Um, but if you're, you're new to Houdini, maybe you're not familiar with them, or if you're in the film industry, uh, this is maybe something that you might want to use but haven't come across in your field. Uh, and the idea behind this, uh, I'll start with um, the cloth example um, that Paul showed a little bit earlier. So Paul showed how to use the, the skinning converter to basically take a cloth simulation and bind a bunch of joints to it and then have that play in your engine. Uh, which is great because uh, if you don't have a lot of texture memory to work with or your engine doesn't allow you to actually play with the vertex uh, shader, um, then that's a good way to do it. But there is another way to do it as well. 
Um, and that's where the vertex animation textures come in. So um, this is um, the sim playing um, basically uh, as it goes. I mean, this is the Vellum solver uh, in all its glory. Um, and it's, it's moving through that relatively quickly. But then what I want to do is I want to export this out. Um, and, and the skinning converter, as, as good as it is, might not necessarily give you the detail that you want for, for higher precision stuff. Um, and, and that's where the vertex animation textures come in. So the way that this works um, is we'll come over here. I've actually cached this out already just to, to save time. Um, is I'm going to take this and I'm going to write it out uh, to a texture. So the way that I do that um, is uh, I can drop down in my out context uh, a vertex animation textures node. Uh, I point it to the thing that I want to export, and you do this to the object level thing, which in this case is uh, my VAT node, uh, which is short for vertex animation textures. Um, and for now, uh, I'm going to leave the settings pretty much at, at default, but we have four different methods that you can export something. You can do soft body, uh, rigid body, fluids, as well as sprites. Um, and just for today, I'm going to be showing soft body and rigid body. Um, and we do have videos online that go into more detail about the others if you're interested in those. But this is kind of just a refresher for, for someone maybe that hasn't come across this. So um, once I've done that and I've kind of plugged it in, um, I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup. We'll rename this uh, Vellum Webinar. And this is just a personal preference. Um, I like to name it based on the name of the node instead of the, the hip file. Um, and with all of that done, um, I can then hit uh, render. Uh, and it will process the geo and generate these textures. So if you've never seen um, uh, a vertex animation texture before, uh, this is what it looks like. And we'll just load it up quickly. Uh, Venom webinar. And I won't go into this too much. I want to leave enough time for Q&A as well. Um, so it looks like this. And so essentially what we're doing is we're storing the position of each vertex in the pixel. So each line of that uh, um, texture uh, represents um, a frame of the animation. Um, and sometimes multiple lines actually represent a frame. Uh, so we can now use this in the vertex shader and the game engine side uh, to, to reproduce this animation. Um, so I'll run you through uh, kind of how we do that. Um, to make life a little bit easier, we do have uh, shaders you can download for Unity. It's part of the game dev tool set. Um, and then directly within here, you can actually open up one of these uh, little boxes. Um, and it has all of this crazy code, which will generate uh, the shader network for Unreal. So if I copy all of this stuff here, um, I can jump back across to Unreal. Uh, and give me a second while I load up the right one. Um, and uh, I'm just going to kind of show you pieces of this without going into all of it. Uh, demo shader. Because I have set this up, like I said, I want to say I don't want to use up too much of your time for this. Uh, and we do have videos that go into more detail if uh, if you're interested. Uh, let's see if we can get this to connect. There we go. Okay. So uh, what I did was just going through that again. Uh, I copy this over here. I come over here. I hit paste, and I get that full network. So hopefully that makes your life a lot easier for setting up your base shader and then you can create your material instances from that. Um, so jumping ahead, uh, like I said, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I'm going to just uh, load something that I've done already. So a couple of things to note, um, and maybe this is worth doing here because I know this question comes up quite a bit. Uh, when you import your mesh, because you're going to get two pieces of data, you're going to get, let's come back here. Uh, you're going to get an FBX file and you're also going to get an EXR or whatever you want to output. So the one is the mesh, the other one is the texture. When you import your mesh, uh, make sure to turn off um, uh, merge degenerate polys. And then actually in your uh, geometry um, uh, settings uh, in the details panel, uh, turn on use full precision UVs uh, and that'll give you a better results uh, for certain things. You generally want to turn that regardless, uh, turn that on regardless. 
Um, and then the other thing is to do with the textures. So uh, once you've imported the texture, uh, you generally want to use vector displacement map as your compression setting. It, it gives a better result uh, than HDR in terms of not messing with these values because we actually want these values to be as precise as possible. Uh, and the other thing is to change your filter to nearest because if it's set to one of the others, it's going to grab position data from different pixels and start blending them together and you're going to get some weird results uh, in uh, your animation. So with all of that being said, um, I have uh, this already set up and uh, it's a um, shader that looks like this. I've plugged in my texture. Um, and then one other thing that I should point out is we do have these bounding box values. So there's this B box, B box max and B box min. Uh, and those numbers help uh, expand the texture which we've normalized into kind of world space. And we plug that into the shader. So once you plug those in, you should get something that looks uh, closer to, to what you have in Houdini. Um, and instead of showing it there, let's actually show it over here. Just turn this on. Um, and there we go. So you're now able to recreate that cloth sim uh, directly in uh, Unreal, um, and, and it'll give you some, some pretty good results. Or Unity, or in fact, like I said, any game engine. Uh, if you're using your own proprietary engine, uh, check out the Unity shaders. They're written um, in HLSL, so they, they should be pretty straightforward to, um, to understand. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention about this, and now I've forgotten what it is. Um, oh, speed. So if you're trying to figure out what the speed value should be, uh, there's, a, there's a quick and dirty hack for this, which is take your frame rate, whatever your Houdini export frame rate was, and divide it by your total number of frames. So in this case, um, I am using uh, 24 frames per second, and there's 239 frames in total. So if I come back here, I can actually just type in 24 divided by 239, uh, and that'll give me the result that I need uh, for my speed value. So uh, that's probably handy for you to know. Uh, okay, so that's cloth. Uh, pretty straightforward, really easy to get it in. Um, and uh, I think the next thing I want to show is uh, rigid body dynamics, um, because that's also pretty cool. And then I'll shut up so we can answer some of your questions. Um, let's see. So what I wanted to show here was instead of using, say, the RBD director and RBD solver for some of the simpler stuff, I wanted to create a, a little bit more of a um, complex example. And um, this is actually, forgive the, the spaghetti network, um, this is a result of the RBD material fracture node uh, set to the wood preset. Um, and this has actually given me a really nice uh, result in terms of uh, getting this to break through this, um, this ball to break through this wooden wall. Um, and get these really nice splinters. Now, there's a couple of things to note here. First of all, there's, um, I think, something close to, uh, yeah, 1,700 chunks. Now, if you try to do this with skeletal animation, uh, you might find the system doesn't deal with it too well. Um, geometry um, detail aside, I'm focusing more on just how many pieces we're, we're trying to deal with. Um, and the other thing with this I'd like to point out that uh, you should investigate is constraints. So as part of the new RBD material fracture stuff, uh, there's an easier way to set up constraints, which is going to give you a much uh, more interesting look. Uh, you'll notice that when this breaks through um, and then eventually kind of starts pulling on this area, it's because of the current constraint system uh, that's doing that. So I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the exporting of this um, for you. Uh, so to do that, um, I'm just going to jump over here, which is where I've got my uh, geometry ready to be exported. Um, and just like I did before, what I can do is I can jump to my art context. Uh, I can drop down a uh, vertex animations texture node. Um, I want to point it to the object that I want to export, which in this case is my wood wall. Um, pretty much the same before. Um, personal preference, I like to change this to OS instead of hip name. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much everything I want to do. And let's rename this 
uh, wall webinar demo. Okay. So with all of that done, uh, what this is going to do is it's going to uh, generate, um, oh yeah, one other thing I need to do, change the method from soft to rigid. Um, and that's going to now export the mesh, uh, a position texture, as well as a rotation texture, because we actually need something that's going to uh, rotate each chunk as opposed to rotating each vertex, which is a little bit more um, concise. Uh, so with all of that being said and done, um, I can at this point hit render. Uh, it'll go through and it'll kind of cache all of the frames, uh, figure out the information that it needs, um, and, then, and then set that up. So hopefully this is pointing at the right thing. Yeah, we'll give that a couple of seconds. So when this is done, there's something else that I want to point out uh, is we've actually exposed the attributes that each one of these exports is looking for. So if you do want to modify this, let's say that you have some crazy, weird, awesome setup that you want to do uh, where you don't specifically want to use the attributes that are kind of the defaults, then you can change that. So if you scroll to the bottom, uh, you'll notice that we actually exposed the, the specifically for rigid body. In this case, it's P, rest, and orient. Uh, if it was for soft, you would see that um, we use P and N. And so if you have a different attribute, then you can use that and it'll call that attribute when it's right to the texture. Uh, so jumping back here, uh, this is exactly the same as the soft. You'll see that we've actually got a B box max one and uh, nothing. Um, and the reason we have two is because we're now dealing with the centroid of the, um, the objects as well as the overall object. It's a little bit finicky, but that's what we need in order to get the rigid body stuff to work. So uh, jumping back to my engine side of things, um, what I would do at this point then is import that mesh. So we bring in a, a static mesh of that wall. Um, and by the way, make sure that you have UVs on your object. If you don't have UVs, you're gonna run into problems because we're using a second UV set to handle how we move the stuff around. Um, and also, like I said before, make sure useful precision UVs is turned on. Uh, and just like before, I can copy and paste this, uh, this texture. So I can grab all of this crazy stuff over here, drop it into a shader, and then create a material instance from that. Um, and all of that being said will then give me something that looks like this. So um, it really is a pretty straightforward setup um, for, for getting some pretty complex animations into your game engine. Um, and then it's up to you to decide how you want to manage your, your uh, memory and your CPU and your GPU stuff um, based on whether you want to use these textures or whether you want to use skeletal meshes. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. So just a very quick overview of some of the stuff that, uh, that, we're, we're, that is available. Um, and hopefully it's helpful. Uh, Chris, do I want to pass back to you? Louise? Oh, there's one other thing I, I almost forgot. Um, I do want to mention to you. Um, so a little bit of a, um, a punt here. Um, some of you might know the different uh, type of licenses uh, and some of you might not. So let's kind of just go through this very quickly. Um, I want to point out that there's core effects and engine. And for a lot of uh, game development work, you can actually get away with uh, core. Um, and the reason for that is all of the tools you've seen today, all of the game dev tools will run in core. So if we've done anything to wrap up uh, the RBD director and the RBD solver, that'll run in core. And the reason I point this out is you'll notice that effects uh, is where you get all the good stuff. If you want to make all your custom setups, that's where uh, pyro fluids, rigid bodies, and particles comes in. Uh, but uh, you can get away with using core for a lot of this and then the game dev tools. And then the other thing that we have is Houdini Engine, which is kind of like your batch license. It's what you use if you want to run Houdini as a plugin in Unreal or Unity or your custom game engine. Uh, you can use it for uh, running on a render farm uh, if you want to batch geometry or create renders. Um, so that's kind of what that guy does. Uh, and then we've got a couple of slightly more custom niche uh, offerings for you. So the first one is Houdini Indie. Um, and this is really cool if you're an indie artist or a home user and you just want to have an idea of, uh, of what is possible with Houdini without any of the limitations of the free version. Uh, and I wonder if this, uh, this, this slide is still up to date, but basically you're limited in your, your render resolution. 
So you can't uh, go above uh, 1080p. Um, and it's, it, it saves it out as a slightly different file, but otherwise it pretty much has all of the Houdini FX features. So it's a really great option if you're a small company uh, making less than, I think it's 100,000 a year, um, then I would say check out the Houdini Indie option. Um, and to that, I wanna also point out something which is relatively new, is you can actually get this through Steam. So if you uh, have a Steam account, jump on there and you can actually buy and install Houdini Indie directly from there. Um, and the cool thing with that is it means it manages the license. So you can, I think, use two machines uh, with the same license, um, not concurrently, but it allows you to, to kind of keep all that stuff in one place. So this is, this is like I say, pretty new. Check it out. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, and with that, uh, Chris, did you want to jump in? I was going to say, uh, it's actually 4K by 4K now on Nindy. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was 4K. Okay, so yeah, it's 4K now um, that, uh, that is the limit. Uh, and the other the cool thing with uh, Houdini Indy is you get an engine license as well. You get one license which you can use with Unreal or Unity or something else, and that's an Indy license. So it's a slightly different offering to um, the, the full engine license in that it's tied to an Indy license. Uh, and then lastly, if you really don't want to spend any money, but you just want to play around with Houdini, uh, we have a Houdini Apprentice. So you can download this on the website. Um, it's absolutely free. Um, it is going to give you all of the features that Houdini offers. The limitations are exporting. So you can't export FBXs. Uh, if you do a render, it's going to give you a watermark. Uh, but otherwise, it allows you to, to learn and grow your skills uh, before you're ready to make that leap. Uh, so hopefully that helps give you an idea of, of what's available. And just Thanks. a correction, uh, 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 clarification on the price. The price is now uh, 269 uh, for one year, but if you buy two years, then it's 499, uh, uh, 399, which brings it down to 199 per year if you commit to two years. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Cool, Q&A. So let's uh, start at the top here. Uh, we'll go chronologically. So uh, is the workflow pretty much the same for Unreal? I think you must have been looking at Unity at the time, maybe. Yeah, that one was for the FBX exporting of the skinning converter. And yeah, it's the same. It's yeah. the FBX is the FBX. And if you bring it into Unreal, it's the same. Do we get reality capture for Indie? Yes, reality yeah. capture works even in Apprentice. Um, you'll just need the reality capture license, which they have an Indie price as well. Yeah. Does the game res, uh, game res pipeline automatically reduce the, oh, this thing is jumping around, uh, reduce the meshes and generate projected textures ready for output in a single step or must they generate the texture over that node for baking? It generates everything um, in a single pipe. Uh, on the game res node, it, it spits out the, the textures and the mesh itself. Does Mapbox node include OSM of cities? Yeah, I showed that. I think that was just before I actually yeah. revealed that. Right. Car terrain tools, can terrain tools be used with this erosion sim, for example? Absolutely. So the, there's a drop down to where you can choose if you want polygons or height fields. So if you keep it in height fields, you can just let it rip through a regular pipeline. So you can do height field distort and add resolution or erode it. Do you consider Redshift as an option for baking? Um, we are looking into other bakers. We haven't considered Redshift. Um, we're looking at um, Substance, X Normal, and Marmoset as kind of supplements to Mantra. Um, when we do a Baker 2.0, but um, Redshift we haven't considered yet. Any convenient way to download tiles with the Mapbox nodes so that they can be snapped together, set up? Not yet, but that's next on the list. So we're trying to figure out if we want to do, you select an area and it just zooms in to where all the tiles you want or an easy way to kind of hop around the next tile over and the next tile down. So if you have any feedback, um, type it up on the chat. And maybe this is related. Uh, another question about Mapbox, can you specify bigger yeah, areas with the line? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, can you use other maps or, and normals or something to relight an imposter? Uh, yeah, so I think I touched on that briefly, but uh, if you are using a principal shader, then you get all of the same exports you would get uh, from that, which means you can create a base uh, color texture, your normals texture, and then you can bring that in to your, your shader and your engine, and then you can relight uh, in the engine. Great. Um, this question is about the the... Brimstone game. Uh, a while ago, you guys were working on the Lava Racing game uh, where you said you'd share the insights and nuts and bolts. Is this still on? So there are some videos. I mean, you've done some presentations, Luis, for sure, at, G at uh, GDC. So yeah. that would 
that would be a good segue to, to mention that that all of the talks and webinars that we um, are able to record are, are featured on talks and webinars on sideeffects.com under, uh, I think it's under learn. Yeah, it's under under the learn tab. There's one called talks and webinars. So this one today would, there would be there, for example, all of the GDC stuff, all of the SIGGRAPH stuff um, is all there. So um, the next question by Brian, the most valuable thing we have been able to provide to studio artists has been creating HDAs that allow them to directly modify their geometry as it exists in, in another tool like Maya. I have recently had some success with the game dev static fracture export tool to create geometry for runtime destruction, but are currently exporting and importing FBI files between Houdini and other tools. I'm very new to Houdini and I assume the results of nodes like that can be somehow set up in HDA. The, L the LOD create tool looks like it would be similarly powerful if it could be done on geometry directly in another tool like Houdini engine or with yes. Houdini engine. Uh, so the LED create tool, uh, you can actually use it in uh, Unreal and Unity already. Uh, we're looking at the, the Maya one since it is a bit of a different workflow. It needs to generate new a new object. Um, you can do everything that the tool has aside from the baking because right now Houdini Engine does not support the funneling of uh, shaders from the application you're working in into Houdini for the baking side. Uh, but the geometry you can do with it. Great. Uh, next question from Juan. Uh, from Mapbox, can we run an erosion sim on it? Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. It's just right. a regular height field. You can do whatever you want. For the RBD director, how can we modify the force from the object? Uh, so the, the, the force, uh, you can, there's, there's two things you can do. The one is you can basically just change the, the magnitude of the force. So uh, you can either use uh, an SDF or an object, and, and it will use the direction of that to, to control the direction of the force, or you can have a global force. So if you just want to have like wind or something else heading in a certain direction, there's an option on the RBD director to turn that on. Um, so like I said earlier, the idea here is that this will give you basic forces and basic controls. If you want to do more custom stuff, you'd probably want to be doing it uh, with uh, your own setups. Great. Jim is requesting a webinar on some of these tools for non-game purposes. Uh, so there was a bunch of questions on this on the chat. Uh, of course, anyone can use these tools. It's not just game people. Um, so feel free. Um, we will do a webinar on, on non-game sort of centric uses of the game tools. Uh, we had that planned um, sometime in the next few weeks. We'll take your feedback though, because we're all game guys. So we have no idea how you guys are using these on film. We have general ideas, but if you guys have suggestions or any things you want to see applied, definitely let us know. Yeah. Um, the name came from these guys having background in games and, and having a, a focus on, on game workflows. Um, but it, but we also recognize that, uh, that it kind of pigeonholes them into a, into a segment uh, on game side versus film TV and advertising. Um, but certainly they can be used to either, either side, all sides. Uh, is there a topology limit to vertex animation textures? Uh, the short answer would be ask your neighborhood friendly tech artist because it's going to really depend on your project. Um, there's there's not necessarily um, a limit, uh, but there is a limit in your texture size. So if let's say you're doing 4K as your, your max texture size, then that's going to limit the number of uh, vertices that you can include um, and also the number of lines of animation you have. So if you have so many lines of animation that it needs to use two or three lines per uh, frame, then that's also going to kind of create a limit. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of up to you. Uh, Luis, did you want to add anything to that? No, yeah, that it's a factor of how many points you have versus how many frames you have. Um, generally speaking, it starts to fall apart precision-wise around 6K textures. Mm -hmm. So usually like 4K is a safe upper limit. So it's 4K by 4K, do the math, and then you divide polygons by frames. Yeah, but you can always, of course, split your mesh into multiple pieces that you can then combine in your engine again. So limit, like Mike said, that's really up to your project. Mm. It's going to come down to the fact that a lot of these textures are non-power of two. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that is because uh, UE Unreal won't stream uh, non-power of two textures. Uh, there are ways to get around that by, by, by padding the texture. Um, but that's something else to keep in mind. So when you're, you're loading these textures into memory for your level, they're staying there, they're not going anywhere. And, and that's where tech artists generally come and tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me. So another thing to keep in mind. 
Okay, next question uh, from Matthew. The cluster functionality has been removed from Voronoi on H17. Has something more efficient been created to replace this? Uh, yes, uh, so there, there is an RBD cluster node, I believe now, uh, which, is, which is one of the options. Um, I would suggest if you go and have a look in the documentation at the RBD material fracture node, there's a bunch of links in there to all of the other new nodes that, that support that. So uh, that would probably be your best bet. Great. Rebus is wondering, what was that script language that we used to generate Blueprint? Uh, that is Uscript. Uh, but am, am I? Is that right? No, that doesn't sound right. T3D, I think, is yeah. what it used to be called. Yeah. Back in the day. Basically, if you copy anything out of Unreal and paste, it pastes into that old format, and it still kind of works. Great. Is it possible to turn a vertex animation texture into an HDA for Houdini Engine for Maya? Um, yes. That's a, it's a difficult question to answer, or am, am I wrong there altogether? Um, uh, yeah, it will. Um, you can, because it'll just take a geometry and then it'll dump out the textures on the FBX. Mm. So if you have like an Alembic hash, you can definitely take an Alembic hash and then feed that into, in theory, we haven't tried it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it should. Great. Uh, could you use Houdini Engine to send an animated character to Maya and animate it, f animate it there, for instance? Um, not, you can send geometry from Houdini. Um, you can send a, like a geometry cache to where you can send multiple frames of an animation, but you can't send the rig over to, through, uh, the current Maya plugin and all the engines in general don't support skeletal meshes. Um, so that's something that we want to build for next versions. Um, so any kind of rigging is pretty limited on the engine side at this point. And that was Ed's follow-up comment, I think. Yeah. You can export it as an FBX. Um, so that's the pipeline that we're going to kind of be pushing for in the next few months. Um, but that, that, will, that will go through FBX. Great. Will Houdini Indie on Steam be available for Linux and Mac in the future? Uh, I don't know. I'd say TBD. Yeah. Um, next question. Are there any obvious differences, pluses and minus on using Vertex animation or skinned mesh animation? What should I keep in mind when using my technique when deciding to do flooding simulation? Uh, so, do you want to do it, Mike? Or? Go for it, Paul. OK, so um, first of all, with uh, the skinning converter, it creates a bone-based uh, animation for you, right? Meaning that uh, you could, for example, add, like I said, uh, a secondary physics simulation in real time on top of what you already exported out. Uh, plus, you can even make it uh, collidable with uh, the character because you can have colliders on those bones. However, um, the more small details you have, so for example, small wrinkles in cloth, the more bones you will need. So the more expensive it gets to export something like that out. And that is where the photo animation textures uh, solution comes in because that solution is very lightweight and has basically gives you the identical result for every single vertex throughout the shader. And I think to add to that, uh, based on the question talking about flooding, if you're doing any fluid kind of work where the topology is changing every frame, then the, 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 the skinning generator uh, isn't applicable. It needs to have a constant topology in order to, to bind the bones to it. Great. Hi guys, nice to see everyone again. Some questions on LOD Create. Is there any way to select areas of geometry to keep more detail? In your car example, you dropped to 40% and the headlight turned into a triangle. Could I keep the headlights round until the final LOD? Uh, yes, you can. Um, what I showed are just the simple settings, so to quickly give you something. But every single tab, like for example, in this case, the Mesh Decimation tab also has an advanced dropdown. And under there, uh, you can use custom attributes to um, focus the decimation on specific regions or ignore certain regions at all. Super. Uh, to, uh, question two, can you talk more about the UV processing? Our team is having problems getting decent UVs, large islands, same direction, instead of tons of tiny pieces, trying to do procedurally generated large floating land masses and not manually UVing them at all. Yeah, so we can do a whole webinar on UVing. Um, so I don't know if we can hit too much on the 
webinar, but do check out the new UV flat and UV layout. So there is a lot more features there to the point that we're going to start building some tools for like strip texturing, which might be what you're kind of referring to, to where you want to try to do kind of little strips that match to a, a piece of geometry. Um, and then check out the auto UV node. The auto UV node generally, there's a merge small islands feature. Um, and then that's a stop by itself that kind of does that to where it kind of consolidates islands back together to where it give you larger islands uh, with more distortion at some point. I was going to say, it sounds like we need to follow up on uh, a UVing uh, webinar and then a couple of people have already said, yes, yes, more. Okay. Cool. What is the typical map size for uh, VAT textures? How many frames are they usually in what size map for that? What, when do you use VAT versus RBD? Uh, so I think we kind of answered that uh, earlier. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we've covered that. Okay. Um, should I expect native Houdini curve inputs in Unreal to be as reliable as world outliner curve inputs? I find world outliner curves cross the editor too often to use. Um, ideally, you're using the world outliner curves and they shouldn't crash the editor too often to use um, because the nice thing about keeping them outside of the native Houdini one is they can feed it into multiple assets. And hi, Chelsea. Um, so the idea there is if you have one road, you can actually run it. Um, you can do a collision pass on it. You can do terraforming and they're kind of separate from the Houdini asset. So if you keep it as part of the Houdini asset, it makes it harder for you to kind of chain these operations together. Um, but we'll, we'll take a look at those crashes. Are you guys responsible for the Uni Unity Houdini plugin? If so, do you plan on supporting the new Unity 2018.3 terrain layer system to paint terrain? If so, when? Um, we're not, um, but Zeeland is, um, so he's part of our extended team. Um, I will, he just gave a presentation at Unite last week, yeah. so he might chat a little bit about on that. I'm not sure. Um, I do know that we're very interested in the terrain system because we have a lot of terrain tools. So um, as information becomes available, we'll, we'll share that with you guys. Yeah. Can SOP terrain tool be multi-threaded? It's a bit slow for bigger areas, and can it be made H17 compatible? Uh, to be made multi-threaded, I'll have to look into that. Uh, as for Houdini 17 compatible, if there are any tools that haven't or that broke during the conversion of upgrade of 16.5 to 17, please do report them to us uh, because we can't run through all the tools ourselves. So we rely on uh, the users providing us with that information. Yeah. Will this video be available? Yes, it will. Um, Ryan's asking, we saw the example of the skinning converter working on with cloth. I assume the workflow will work with RBD as well. Yes, for that, uh, for RBD workflows, uh, we have a tool called uh, RBD to FBX, which essentially generates a bone per uh, piece of your simulation. Um, so that's a separate tool, but yes, it can do that. Great. And success, we've gotten through the questions. We've made it to the end without tripping over them, so that's good. Um, one to, we had a few people saying um, uh, that they're brand new to Houdini and where do I get started? So I would start with sideeffects.com slash learn. Um, there are some game tool uh, uh, working um, learning paths there. So check that out. Um, we've, we've commissioned some, some tutorials by Andreas Glad who did some great work. Kenny Lammers who did some great work uh, for Unity. Um, so check out lots of that stuff on sideeffects.com. Plus the community is, is constantly creating stuff under the tutorials uh, section. Uh, so feel free to, to eat that stuff up, but also create stuff and share it with the community through sideeffects.com. It'd be great. Yeah. And I would also just like to say that um, we would love to see what you do with the game dev tool set. Uh, not just send us bugs, but also show us cool stuff. We'd love to see it. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see a great presentation on at GDC with these tools uh, in use. So if you have a, uh, a production, sort of production ready, something that you used it in a game, then, uh, then let me know. You can reach me at mc at sideeffects.com, mc at sideeffects.com. Thanks, guys. Uh, oh, so go ahead. So I'm good, Chris, I'm going to jump in. I, one question that came up quite a bit earlier was whether or not the lot tools would work with uh, skin meshes. So I thought it might be worth just answering that on the video. Yeah. Paul? Oh, um, right now, the LED create tool only supports uh, static meshes. Um, since we first want to improve the uh, workflow within Houdini on uh, rigs and animations before we tackle that. Thanks. And Roy just asked, uh, he'd love to know when we can look forward to more features in the GLTF2 pipe, specifically animations. That's probably going to be a Houdini core feature. That's the GLTF is 
technically the game's team, but it's not um, part of the game dev tools. So that will be a future Houdini release. Cool. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, all three of you, uh, great work on the on the webinar. And um, if you have any follow up questions, feel free to ping those guys on either Discord or on um, on the forum. Thanks, everyone. Talk Thanks.